thanks for joining us today. Um, and yeah, as Kathy mentioned, this is a overview of the 2018 results from our hybrid evaluation program here in New York, and uh, and it also includes <laughs> excuse me uh, results from our uh, collaboration with the University of Vermont. Um, I'll apologize up front if I start coughing, but I'll try to try to keep it uh, at bay and uh, um, I'll mute myself if I have to, but uh, so we'll get going here. Um, we'll uh, just talk in general terms about the results of the program and what to look for in our uh, report and uh, also um, talk about a few side projects we've been working on in conjunction with the program. All right. Just trying to get it to advance. Okay, here we go. Um, so 2018 represented the third year since we restarted the program and uh, the second year that we've been collaborating with the University of Vermont um, to uh, implement uh, trial locations in both states. Uh, we have a great team of folks we're working with and um, support from uh, from some grant funding from the New York Farm Viability Institute and the Northern New York Agricultural Development Program, and a lot of support from uh, producers and industry partners as well. These are the locations that we have for our project, and we the way we split it up is into two relative maturity ranges, with each hybrid getting planted at three locations. So you can see here the three locations for the 80 to 95 day hybrids <laughs> and the three locations for the 96 to 110 day hybrids and uh, a real special thanks to our uh, on-farm uh, hosts who uh, um, graciously let us uh, use uh, their some of their land for, for the trials each year and do a really good job helping us maintain them. This was uh, our list of companies that uh, entered the trials in 2018. Uh, this really is a partnership between uh, the, our program and the companies. Without, without their support and entries into the program, we wouldn't have a program. So I always like to acknowledge and thank them. Um, also, if you're working with a company that you don't see on this list, um, uh, you could certainly encourage them to uh, consider entering the program for 2019. Um, just a quick overview of our locations. This is uh, located in our report and later on in the presentation, I'll have a web link to the full report, but uh, this just gives planting date, uh, harvest date, some uh, soil type and other background about the locations. Um, <coughs> This is showing uh, weather data for our trials over the last three years. Uh, rainfall is uh, represented here. Um, we can see from the bars, uh, we don't need much of a reminder, but 2017 was much wetter than 2018 at our trial locations. Uh, now this is at our locations. There, there were parts, especially in the southern tier in New York, that were quite wet this year. Um, but uh, uh, in terms of our the locations where our trials are, are we uh, we definitely had significantly less rainfall compared to last year. G looking at growing degree days, um, the opposite. Uh, we also remember 2017 as being a relatively cool growing season, and we saw across all of our locations where we had certainly had more growing degree days <coughs> in. Uh, um, 2018 relative to, to last season. Just a reminder, uh, we spend a lot of time talking about the forage quality aspects of the trials. So um, you've probably uh, read or heard over the last few years about the term UNDF. Uh, it's undigested neutral detergent fiber. And uh, I just wanted to show some data of why we're moving in that direction. So so this data is over, is uh, about 14 years old now, um, from 2005, this was a study that showed how at the same NDF level, um, 
So in other words, all these samples had an NDF of around 45, but you could have uh, significantly different 30 hour NDF digestibilities. So very different fiber digestibility at the same NDF level. Fast forward to today and we're using UNDF, which is a measure of that undigested fiber um, in the forage. And this is just two examples of hybrids from our trials. And what we see here is um, this first, the, in the first 30 hours, we see that energy value from, uh, from what's rapidly fermentable of that forage. And then going out to 120 and 240 hours, uh, that gives us a good intake of, uh, of intake, or a good indicator of intake potential. Um, and with these two samples, the, the kind of uh, orange colored uh, area at the bottom of the graph represents the uh, percent of that sample that's um, undigested after 240 hours. And you can see here between these two hybrids, there's quite a bit of difference in how much is left over. So hybrid A, there's a lot more material in that forage that uh, won't be digested and is taking up space in the rumen, but not offering uh, any nutritional value to the cow. So we do see differences in our hybrids. And when we look at uh, the UNDF number versus the uh, <coughs> um, NDF B30 hour, which we've been accustomed to looking at, we can see, um, now there's a lot of stuff on here, but what, what we're really looking at is uh, if we pick any given point, for example, if we pick a point at, of a, a NDF digestibility of, at 30 hours of 60, we can see here that there's a, a good 10 to 12 point spread in UNDF 240 at that same, um, at that same level of, of uh, NDF D30. So this is similar to that example I showed uh, where we had uh, the same NDF level with different NDF 30 levels. Now we're now this information helps us better understand how digestible that forage is because we can see even at the same 30 hour digestibility, um, we can have some pretty good differences in the UNDF 240 number. Um, which, which can be meaningful to the cow and, and how much she can eat before her rumen fills up. <clears throat> so moving on to the trials, I like to say that our program is a, is a hybrid evaluation, not a hybrid competition. It's not a, it's not a yield contest. Um, uh, the various states have yield contests that uh, farmers can enter, but this, this isn't a yield contest. This is a hybrid evaluation and we're, as much as we focus on yield uh, as one of the parameters, the forage quality is really what is of uh, significant interest to us. And so when it comes to picking the best fit for your farm, we need to think about how consistent the hybrid is across locations. So not just how it performed at one location, but um, how did it do across multiple locations under different weather conditions. And <clears throat> look for what hybrids performed well um, on soil types or uh, length of growing season similar to your farm. Uh, other factors, you know, uh, the di that digestible fiber is an important indicator of predicted milk yields. Um, and so looking at that number and what might affect that digestible fiber, it's going to be uh, hybrid genetic soil type weather yield. We'll get and we'll get into that a little bit more. Um, so, and then also what, what factors match your feeding program? So is starch really important to you because of the, what, what other feeds you have available to you or is the digestible fiber more important? Uh, is you, you know, are you really limited on acres? So it yields important to all of us, but it may be a little bit more important if uh, you're really limited on your acreage. <coughs> so, uh, I always throw this question out when I'm uh, giving this presentation in person, but it's kind of, you know, it's a bit of a um, leading question here is 26 tons per acre a good yield. And it's all, it's really all relative to uh, what, what we're comparing it to. If we had a plot where the 
average was 21 tons per acre, then yes, 26 is, looks really good and is probably uh, towards the top of the list. However, if that plot yielded had an average of 31 tons per acre, then all of a sudden 26 tons doesn't look so good anymore. So we really need to know what we're comparing the data to. And that's what I really spend a lot of time stressing with our trials, because we don't want to just use these trials to go in and pick the, the hybrid that happened to come out at the top of the heap at one location and for a certain parameter. We really want to look at it relative to that location. And just an example of that, um, Dr. Randy Shaver at Wisconsin had put together a, a, a summary of lab results uh, where he looked at these different parameters and he summarized over over 100,000 samples from four of the major forage testing laboratories in the country <coughs> and found these averages for UNDF 240 and NDF D 30 hour. So, um, so those, you know, these are averaged across a lot of samples, but when we apply them to our data set, uh, this is the ranges that they fall into. And if we look at that on a percentage basis, um, you know, generally this year was a little higher in NDFD 30, but generally a very low percentage of our samples actually fall into that, those averages. So, um, and on any given year, those, those averages could uh, be, could either get you a good hybrid or, or a not so good hybrid. So, so in other words, um, in 2017, when we had poorer growing conditions and in general less digestible forage, um, you could have said you wanted a, a number, you know, a, a UNDF 240 between 24 and 27. And if we look at the, um, if we look at the orange uh, dots on here, uh, it would have been very hard to find that. Just some of the best hybrids may have had that sort of UNDF level where. Um, where if we look at the blues for 2018, where we had on average much more digestible forage, if you ask for that same value in a hybrid, um, almost some of the worst, some of the, <coughs> sorry, some of the least digestible hybrids in the whole trial still fell into that, that sort of range. So, um, so knowing what you're dealing with for that growing season can really help you um, understand what to ask for um, when selecting hybrids. So this is just a summary of our data from the last three years and it's really saying the same thing the last one did. So, um, you know, in any given growing season, our, our, our data acts as a, um, acts as kind of a barometer of what, what the averages were. So, you know, again, we can see that, um, you could ask for, a, uh, you know, then you can ask your seed representative for hybrids in their lineup and see how they compare to that average for that growing season. Because um, in, in a year like 2017, uh, you're going to have to calibrate yourself differently for um, how you uh, look at and evaluate data and, and hybrid performance compared to 2018, where your calibration is gonna be different because stuff like starch levels and digestibility were much different in those two years. Another way to look at the data, <laughs> um, just showing what most of you that are feeding, that are now feeding the 2018 crop probably know, um, is that we have, uh, uh, it, ten, it tends to feed better, at least nutritionally. I know there's some other issues out there like mycotoxins and, and yeast and stuff like that that may be causing trouble. But nutritionally, it tends to be feeding lot better. And we see this again, you know, UNDF, a lower number is better because that means there's less of that undigested fiber in the sample. And we see over 50% of the samples um, collected in our trials in 2018 <coughs> were between 9 and 10 where in 2017 it peaked out at uh, at 13 to 14. Similarly with starch, the difference isn't quite as drastic, but we do see that we our peak in terms of the percent of samples at a 
um, higher starch level peaked out better at 2018 compared to 2017. And this is just showing for two of our locations, Aurora and Madrid, we had three years worth of data. And this is <coughs> suggesting that um, digestibilities were similar um, compared to uh, 2016, where we had a similar growing season. Um, starches actually look a little bit, um, even a little bit better, at least at our uh, Aurora location for, for 2018. But um, you know, it's helpful to think about these multi-year trends and how, how this year's crop is performing and feeding relative to, to last year's. So the way we present our data is, is in these uh, plots, which have four quadrants where we plot crop yield against milk yield. Um, so what we're looking at is really if we focus in on quadrant two, the upper right corner, that's where the crop yield and the milk yield were above average for that location. And you can follow around and look at what the other quadrants are. You know, I would argue in this case, it's a good way to look at the data and really three of the four quadrants um, give you good information. Um, and, and, you know, potentially quadrant three gives you good information too, as it uh, may tell you which ones to stay away from. But, uh, you know, while quadrant two might be our kind of the ones that really performed well in yield and predicted milk yield, um, quadrant one may be helpful in thinking about if you need some high yielding material for uh, for heifers or other non-lactating animals, um, quadrant four may be helpful to think about if you have uh, quite a bit of inventory but are looking at getting the best quality you can. <coughs> and again, we, we really want to use these at more than one location. We don't want to just look at this data and look at the hybrids at one location. We want to look at multiple locations and see see where they showed up across across the all the locations they were planted. So this is how it looks in our report, and I want to draw your attention to a few things if you're not used to looking at our, our report. Um, so this is a uh, I just uh, randomly selected. Actually, this was one of our 2017 trials, but the the data looks the same in 2018. I selected one of them to show you. So what we do here is we put the information on a, a hundred per, uh, put percent of plot mean with a hundred percent where the lines cross being the plot average. So what's the plot average in this case? Well, we tell you that up in the corner here, uh, the average yield at that location was 28.4 tons and the average predicted milk yield was 82.8 pounds per day. And sorry, I should say that that predicted milk yield is coming from the Cornell um, nutrition model, which is a, a dynamic model that you enter the feeding information and a, the cow information into and it provides you with a predicted milk yield. This model is the backbone of uh, several commercial softwares that are out there that many nutritionists use to balance um, diets with across the, the country. <coughs> Um, so when we look at this, that means if we look over here at crop yield, that 100% is actually 28.4 tons. But going back to that uh, previous slide where we, where we talked about it all being relative, um, you know, what we're really interested in here is not if that was 18.4 tons or 28.4 tons. We're interested in the hybrids that may have been 5 or 10% above that or 5 or 10% below that. So, and again, with milk yield down at the bottom, that 100% is actually 82.8 pounds per day. Now, the next thing that we want to look at, and, and I purposely picked this one because it had a lot of variability. This 2017 location uh, happened to have a lot of variability. So I wanted to show the other aspect of this, which is the least significant difference, but shows up in the bottom left corner. And this is scaled. Um, just like on an old atlas, uh, I know we all use GPS now, but if you pull out an atlas and there's that scale on the bottom that for inches to miles, um, this is scaled similarly. And uh, what we can see here is that if the least significant difference for milk yield is 13.9% uh, and, um, or sorry, that's, oh, sorry, that's a little messed up, but uh, 
it anyways it, the um, crop yield is 13.9 percent the milk yield is 13.8 percent um, so what does that mean well if we if we uh, take those uh, lines and follow them up to a point I just randomly picked hybrid number nine here basically what it means is anything anything that's showing up in that shaded area in crop yield means it's statistically the same so <clears throat> anything in that uh, range of crop yield is statistically the same as the hybrid that you have. While with milk yield, again, I, I mentioned I picked a, purposely picked a plot that had a lot of variability to show you because this is showing that there's a huge range in, um, a huge range in uh, the, uh, the yield for, uh, um, the predicted milk yield. So basically it means anything in that shaded area is statistically the same. So you got to get outside that shaded area, either above or below that hybrid to, um, to see that a, a hybrid was statistically better or worse than the one in the shaded area. So <laughs> um, each year we aim for the least amount of variability possible, but sometimes the weather conditions uh, give us a lot of variability as we saw with this particular location in 2017. And so it's nice when we have n nice tight lines uh, with small LSD values because that is an indicator to us that, you know, there's more significance in the data. But sometimes we do get these plots where um, regardless of what we do, we get a lot of variability because of the weather and, and we need to be cautious of that because if we look at this, um, how spread apart some of these dots are, we would think that's, you know, five, five or ten percent difference might be uh, significant, but in some cases it's not. So uh, part of what we've done with our program is not just the work we're doing in New York and Vermont with our actual trials, but also partnering with several other groups and universities to expand um, what we're doing regionally and better do a better job of uh, combining our data and and uh, you know I mentioned earlier that the southern tier in New York had a much wetter season than a lot of the rest of the state and where our trials were so our trial locations might not be reflective of what uh, the weather patterns in that part of the state this year however um, there the weather patterns did match up with a lot of what Pennsylvania got and so we're, we've been working with the um, PDMP and Penn State University to um, to uh, bring our data in, in alignment with each other so we can cross-reference data from the two states and a producer can pick up the reports from either state and look at the information, see what's there, and see what the type of growing conditions they had. So this is just a, a summary of uh, our trial results and where they're housed um, on our different websites. <coughs> Excuse me, to allow you to take a look at uh, um, the full reports and, and the different hybrids involved. We did, we did a little project this year where we had four hybrids, that uh, the same four hybrids planted at eight different locations. You can see those eight different locations on the map here. It's kind of neat to be able to see that we had the same high data from the same hybrids from, uh, you know, central Maine to central Pennsylvania. And, uh, you know, here we should see the weather information and uh, um, just uh, just that crazy season that much of Pennsylvania had with, you know, hovering around 30 inches of rain or more for the growing season. Um, where uh, compared to what we had across uh, much of the Northeast. Uh, the uh, orange line on top is uh, the growing degree days. And we see while it was uh, a little colder in Maine, um, as we might might expect, but uh, um, you know, we see a, actually not a lot of difference in, in growing degree days across uh, all those locations, which is kind of interesting. So what do we do with the data from this? Well, we're just looking, we're, we're looking for trends. We're looking for 
how these hybrids uh, performed across these very growing conditions. Um, and just a reminder of when we look at these scatter plots with uh, all the dots on them, you know, so the one on the left here is a positive relationship, whereas one, one parameter changes, the other one is, goes up uh, accordingly. The closer, the tighter these dots are to the blue line, the stronger that relationship is. And the, on the right is a negative relationship. Uh, most of you have seen this before. It's just, I just find it helpful to put a little reminder in of what we're looking at. And then uh, um, on the opposite side of having a strong relationship is when we have a, just what we sometimes call a shotgun pattern where, where the dots are just all over the place and there's really no, no relationship at all um, between the data. So this is something we're, you know, we're looking at. And so I bring that up to show the seasonal rainfall. So this is a bit of a, a small data set, so we can't take too much from it. But uh, there's been some other data sets and some other reporting showing how seasonal rainfall um, can uh, negatively infect, uh, negatively affect the digestibility of fiber in the corn silage. And we do see that, um, we do see a, a slight downward trend in fiber digestibility with higher rainfall. But again, it's, it, we, we need a bigger data set. This is just some initial information, but it, it does kind of match some other research that's been done. Um, but what was interesting, because we had four different hybrids replicated at each of these locations, if we look at the individual hybrid data, we see that while there is that kind of um, slight uh, trend line downward, that um, even at the Pennsylvania sites where uh, they had, uh, you know, around 30 inches of rain. Um, there were some hybrids that were just as digestible at uh, those locations as some of the hybrids in the New York and uh, Vermont and Maine locations. So it, it tells us that, yeah, the weather does uh, impact this, but there's definitely a lot of individual hybrid genetics um, so, you know, it's an interaction between the genetics and the weather patterns that are, that are giving us these results. And then a shift now to so another uh, kind of side trial we did. So each year we, we plant these large trials um, to evaluate all these hybrids across the, the region. And uh, we're always looking for what sort of other information we can, we can uh, glean from the trials. So over the last two seasons, we've had uh, grant funding from the New York Corn and Soybean Growers Association and the Northern New York Ag Development Program to look at Western bean cutworm damage. Uh, Western bean cutworm is a pest that's been increasing in New York um, and, and mycotoxins. What is, and it, if, uh, if Western bean cutworm damage seems to be a, a precursor for more mycotoxins in our corn silage. So uh, it was interesting. In 2017, we had uh, we had traps at both locations, which trapped the male moths. So they're not uh, necessarily a, a great indicator of how many females are there laying eggs, but they give us an idea of how many moths there were total. So we evaluated our Madrid and Aurora locations. Madrid did have more uh, moths in the trap, and uh, and when we look at the number of hybrids that had damage from those, um, we see that nearly twice as many hybrids um, had some level of Western bean cutworm damage at Madrid compared to Aurora. Um, however, when we, when we took samples at harvest for mycotoxin screening, um, we saw that the total number of hybrids that tested positive for some level of mycotoxins was about the same even though Madrid had twice as many hybrids with, um, with damage. And uh, another interesting point is if we look at the Aurora location, um, of the 17 hybrids that tested positive for mycotoxins, um, only four of them actually had damage. 13 of those 17 that tested positive for mycotoxins didn't even have any Western bean cutworm damage. So we repeated this. Uh, um, at, with a slightly bigger data set from all of our locations in 2018. Um, and uh, actually the Alltech uh, 
the company um, has partnered with us on this and is helping us uh, providing some analysis on our Vermont locations, but uh, we don't have that back yet, but we're excited to add that in with our New York data that was funded by corn growers in the Northern New York Ag Development. Um, so looking at 2018, um, this was a map from the New York State IPM program of the hot spots of where we saw uh, high levels of uh, western bean cutworms in the maw or in the traps. And then this is our location. This is out of every single plot at each of these locations. This was the percent of the plots with western bean cutworm damage just before harvest for silage. So we see there's quite a spread there um, between locations. And we do see that Madrid and Willsboro um, in northern New York uh, tended to be higher. Um, uh, Aurora was quite a bit higher this year too, um, but that kind of matches where we see some of the uh, higher trap counts as well. So if we look at our data from 2018, it's similar to the uh, previous table where we looked at the percent of the plots that we screened um, for Western being cutworm damage. And we see, uh, we see there's a little variability there with Albion being the lowest. Um, and, and then we go down to the bottom in the green and we look at the total plots uh, that tested positive for mycotoxins. <laughs> and uh, we see that there, the levels were relatively low. Uh, in northern New York, um, despite uh, uh, the damage levels. Um, but what, what really stands out is Aurora, which was our latest uh, harvest location. It was the dry matters were higher, it was later in the season, and that was just obliterated. 90% of the samples had mycotoxins. Um, however, only 24% um, had western meat cutworm damage. And again, if we look at the uh, down at the bottom, we see that of those 57 plots with uh, west or with, with mycotoxins, only 11 of them had western bean cutworm damage. 46 of them had had no damage, but still had mycotoxins. So, and we see similar trends at all the locations where, in every case, the number of um, the number of samples. Uh, testing positive for mycotoxins was actually larger where there was no western bean cutworm damage. So um, after two years that uh, indicates to us that, um, you know, in this case there's probably bigger things going on than just uh, than the western bean cutworm damage to those ears in terms of what what's causing mycotoxin development. Um, when we look at the uh, this is just another way of looking at that data in terms of the percent of samples at each location. Um, so the blue bar is the percent of samples with western bean cutworm damage and uh, the the orange is the percent of plots with mycotoxins and we see uh, you know across the two years there's no real consistency there. Um, you know I mentioned the the later the later harvest at Aurora and that does seem to be something that's definitely affecting our uh, um, the risk of mycotoxins and we've seen that from other studies and and uh, and reports from <coughs> uh, growers and professionals out in the field this season and this is showing in the blue the the percent the average percent dry matter for all the samples that tested positive versus the average percent dry matter <coughs> for all the samples that tested negative and uh, and when we look at that for Aurora, the samples that were testing uh, positive definitely had a higher dry matter. Plus, you know, it was our latest harvest, harvested site. And there's definitely seems to be an interaction there between whole plant dry matter and harvest dates as a management function of uh, um, the risk of those mycotoxins developing in a year like 2018. We also did a small survey um, where uh, crop consultants and extension agents, if they found a field, were working, if they were working with a grower and found a field that had uh, heavy western bean cutworm pressure, 
they took some samples at harvest to have analyzed at the lab. And, uh, you know, here out of 10 or 11 uh, <coughs> field locations that were sampled um, at harvest around the state, only three of them um, actually tested positive for any mycotoxins, despite the, the high levels of Western bean cutworm damage. So that kind of matches what we what we saw in our at our trial locations. Uh, we were curious about feeding the feeding damage and if it affected st yield total yield or starch um, levels of the corn silage. And we can see, you know, again these scatter plots where um, there's no real no real consistency. Um, it's not. You know, again, we might expect some sort of negative relationship where as uh, more kernels were eaten that, you know, starch levels might go down. Um, but we didn't really see that in any sort of um, significant way in, in either 2017 or, or 2018. So, um, so just looking at the results, you know, again, we're, this is for silage. Uh, I think there are more chances for mycotoxins to develop in grain corn when there's uh, in injuries to the ear. So if you have insects like western bean cutworm or other problems that are causing injuries to the ear and it's left out there for grain, I think there's more risk of, of uh, mold and toxin development. But at the stage we're harvesting for silage, um, we don't see, <coughs> uh, we don't see uh, a real strong trend there. Um, I would also point out that what we found here in New York were um, toxins related to the uh, fusarium type funguses and that is what's fairly common in New York. We do see some other stuff sometimes and we need to keep an eye out but uh, you know if, if this um, if this same study was done in the uh, southeastern part of the United States where there's different uh, funguses and toxins present, um, you might get different results. So we need to realize that these results are, are uh, you know, um, representative of the type of molds and toxins that we saw uh, in New York that we, we found in our trial data. And uh, we probably shouldn't take these results and, uh, and uh, apply them in in other areas of the country uh, where there's where different molds and toxins are more prevalent. Um, but it, but what it does suggest is that, you know, in terms of uh, picking uh, hybrids with protection for Western bean cutworm, which uh, is really the Viptera trait is uh, the only one on the market right now that uh, really shows good protection for Western bean cutworm. Uh, there's good reasons to to look at that trait <coughs> to protect your corn in certain situations, but the idea of buying that trait just to reduce your risk of mycotoxin development um, definitely isn't supported by what we've found here. Uh, so, um, just you know, something to keep in mind as you look at trait packages for um, for uh, selecting corn. What we do see is that um, you know some apparent risk factors include the fact that uh, the fusarium type diseases can get into the uh, ear through the silk channels at pollination. So when we have wet conditions at pollination, we can see problems and that interaction of higher whole plant dry matter and, and the date of harvest definitely seems to be, be a driver with some of this. Um, so that's what I had for you in terms of an overview of the trials. You know, again, you can go to, uh, I'll, uh, I'll skip back to the slide with the, uh, with the um, website on it for the trial results to, v to view the whole report. Um, but uh, I wanted to give you an overview of what we saw in 2018 and, and you know, how, how we think you can best utilize the, the trial data for, um, 